Well, good morning once again, church family. It's so good to, uh, to be in worship with you on this special day. It's Mother's Day. And to all you moms out there, we, uh, uh, we love you and we thank God for you. And we're uh, elated that you're able to worship with us here at Celebration Worship at Pioneer Drive. Let me encourage you to open your Bibles to uh, the little letter of 2 Timothy near the, uh, near the two-thirds of the way through the, Old, uh, the New Testament, probably uh, more than that. Uh, 2 Timothy comes right before Titus, Philemon, and Hebrews, and we'll be in the first chapter. We're just going to read this passage and really not come back to it until we get near the end of the sermon. So if you have that passage... Uh, or if you can see it on your screen, if you're watching and worshiping with us by way of the internet, let's stand if it's possible for you to do so in honor of the reading of God's word. Second Timothy chapter one, I'll begin reading at verse three. The apostle Paul writes to Timothy, I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, longing to see you even as I recall your tears so that I may be filled with joy. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm sure that it is in you as well. May God add his richest blessing to this, the reading of his word, and may his Holy Spirit apply the preaching and the teaching of his word to our hearts and to our lives this day. Go ahead and be seated. I'm grateful this morning for the music that's already been shared and, and uh, uh, thank you to Danny and uh, the team for uh, leading us in worship. Grateful for Libby singing that uh, beautiful solo and uh, goodness, she's just uh, eight years old and uh, uh, when I was eight years old, I could buy, barely tie my shoestrings and here she is singing uh, solos on Mother's Day and it, uh, it's so beautiful and lifts up our heart. You know, children sometimes show keen insight into living and, and into matters of, of family and even marriage. I received from uh, someone not too long ago a list of children's responses to some serious questions about marriage. I thought I might just share some of those with you. To the question, how do you decide who to marry? 10-year-old Alan responded, you got to find somebody who likes the same stuff. He said, like, if you like sports, she should like that you like sports, and she should also keep the chips and dip coming. <laughs> Kirsten, who is 10 years old and obviously a little girl, had a different perspective. She said, no person really decides before they grow up who they're going to marry. God decides it all, uh, God decides it all way before, and you get to find out later who you're stuck with. To the question, what's the right age to get married? Camille, who was also 10 years old, said 23 is the best age because by then you've known that person forever. Another question was, how can a stranger tell if two people are married? Eight-year-old Derek responded, you might have to guess based on whether they seem to be yelling at the same kids. <laughs> I love that. What do you think your mom and dad have in common was another question. Lori, age eight, responded immediately, both don't want no more kids, she said. Or the question, what do most people do on a date? Ten-year-old Martin said, on the first date, they just tell each other lies, and that usually gets them interested enough to go for a second date. Kelvin, age, age eight, had an interesting response to the question, how would the world be different if people didn't get married? He said, there sure, sure would be a lot of kids to explain, wouldn't there? <laughs> and finally, I think you'll like the response of 10-year-old Ricky. How would you make a marriage work? Ricky said, tell your wife that she looks pretty, even if she looks like a truck. Oh, Ricky, I don't know about that. I drove by uh, Arrow 4 today and saw some pretty good looking trucks. So that might not be a, a put down to say somebody looks like a truck, but some great responses. I want to take that last question. Uh, how do you make a marriage work? And, and on this Mother's Day, expand it a little bit to how do you make a family work? And to do that, I, I want us to focus on some homework. 
I know that in these days of uh, isolation and separation and, and distancing, most parents have had to invest more time in, in uh, helping their children uh, with their homework than usual. I don't have any children at home doing homework, but I have a school teacher at home. My wife teaches middle school, and she's calling all of her students and making sure they're staying up with assignments. And most of the time, she's also talking to their parents because they're having to invest time in their children's education more so than usual. Well, today in Celebration Worship, let's talk about the kind of essential homework that must be done and accomplished in our families if families are to become what God wants them to be. If you're taking notes, as I would encourage you to do, uh, this is probably the first assignment you want to write down. First, the education of the heart is done ideally in the family. The education of the heart is done in the family. Children will learn from their moms and dads what to love in life. Ideally, children will learn that what they love most and first will determine how and if everything else falls into place later on. From the earliest times, God has made this responsibility clear for parents. Listen to what he says in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments I give to you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. In other words, it is the responsibility of believing parents to surround our children with the love of God and with respect for the word of God. In that way, children will be taught to love the father and they will see in their own parents' lives what love for God really looks like. The education of the heart ideally is done in the home. Here's the second assignment. Children must learn from their families what to value. What to value. Now, I know today some parents have the impression that they shouldn't um, impose their values on their children, that, that our children should be left free to develop their own values. Moms and dads, please hear me. If parents don't teach their children values, the culture will. Madison Avenue teaches values. Hollywood teaches values. ESPN teaches values. Johnny Walker, Jim Bean, espouse, espouse values. Rock bands and country western singers, the whole world of entertainment, including all the, the movies that we see, they all communicate values. And it's the values primarily of our culture. Good parents, responsible parents, I, I would say Christian parents, must be counter-culture in that we are called to counter the values of our culture with deeper values and richer values. Family need, families need core values that can, can teach our children and family members uh, what, what purpose there is in life and give meaning to life and, and, and values that guide their choices as they seek to navigate their way through this most complex world. When our children were at home, Claudia and I had uh, some core values that we tried to, to pass on to our children. The first one being faith in God. Uh, we believe that that was foundational as, as a, uh, a value. Uh, a second one was just self-improvement through good education. We believed in education and we tried to impart that to our children. A third one was civic mindedness. You know, we live in the greatest uh, uh, state in the union. We live in the greatest nation on earth and that brings with it a lot of benefits, but it also brings with it a lot of responsibility. And so we tried to instill that civic mindedness in our boys. Also ethical living. You just, just do what's right simply because it's right, whether it feels right or not. Now, these are just four core values, but they're basic to living what the Bible would call a, a good life, a responsible life, a rewarding life. I tell my grandchildren every time that I see them, before I leave, I whisper in their ears, Ford, Millie, God loves you and I love you. Uh, I know a grandfather who always asks his grandchildren, tell me what your job is. And at first they didn't know what their granddad was talking about, but they know now. They say, granddad, my job is to help somebody. 
that granddad is, is imparting to those grandchildren values. What to value in life. Jesus put it this way in Matthew 6. Your heavenly father knows all your needs and he will give you all you need from day to day if you live for him and make the kingdom of God your primary concern. Children must learn from their family what to value. Here's the third assignment. Families are about time together. Time together. You know, pollsters report to us that parents spend 40% less time with their children today than parents did in the 1950s. In particular, dads, I think we are uh, more guilty of this than, than the moms. On the average, dads spend less than 30 minutes per week engaged in conversation with their children. That's about four and a half minutes per day. USA Today reports that 67% of American households eat their meal at night in a room where the television is blaring or it's blaring in an adjacent room, virtually making good conversation uh, impossible because of all the noise that's going on. Children need more parental time today because for one thing, they have fewer adults to count on. And secondly, their world is far more dangerous and complex than the one in which we grew up. Children want to be close to their parents. I remember hearing from a fellow minister not long ago about a new family that had moved into their town and they had joined this pastor's church. They were from out of state. And they had a 12-year-old boy who was having a really difficult time adjusting to the newness of it all. And they asked the pastor if he might visit with the boy. And he sat down and as they talked, the boy said, yes, sir, I'm having a hard time. He said, it's a, it's a whole new set of friends. It's a whole new church and a whole new neighborhood and a whole new school. But he said, really, it's a, it's a new house too. And, and the pastor picked up on that. He said, you mean you, you don't like your new house? He said, no, sir, I don't. He said, what's wrong with it? He said, it's too big. He said, I liked our old house. It was smaller. He said, I could go to bed at night and the last thing I would hear would be my parents down the hall talking. Or we'd spend time at the, at the, at the table in the kitchen and we'd just sit there and we'd talk together and, and that's where I did my homework and everybody sort of pitched in and helped me out. But, but our new house is so big that everybody's too far apart. Parents, don't underestimate your child's desire for you to be close to them. They may not always express it, but it's there. They like familiar places. They like routines. The Bible reminds us to be very careful to take advantage of the time we have since there are so many evil influences in our culture. Ephesians 5 verses 15 and 16 is a word to the wise. It reads, therefore, be careful how you walk or how you live, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time or the most of your opportunity because the days are evil. Families are about time together. Fourth, strong families practice the 10-1 rule or the 10-1 rule. That means that they make roughly 10 positive comments for every one negative comment. They also find positive, creative ways to help their children uh, resolve sticky situations. When I was uh, growing up in Southern California from 1965 to 1972, uh, those were my junior high and high school years, our church was in Long Beach. And uh, there was this particular girl in our, our youth group that was very popular. And her mom was kind of a mom for the whole youth group. I, I imagine nearly every church youth group has a mom like that, or at least needs a mom like that. She, she understood us as teenagers. She got us. Uh, she wasn't particularly educated, but she was wise and she was compassionate. Well, her daughter became friends with a girl at her high school. The girl didn't go to our church, didn't go to any church. And this particular friend, uh, found it easy to get into trouble. In fact, a lot of times she made trouble. Uh, she was one of those teenagers for whom there was just a fine line between fun and a felony. Uh, we all know kids like that. Well, my church friend's mom said to her daughter, hey, I want you to be friends with whoever you choose to be friends with. And when your father or I are at home, you can invite any of your friends to our house and we will welcome them and you guys are free to hang out here. But, and she said this very carefully. 
this friend that you have recently made at school, um, she just has a knack for making poor decisions. And we don't want you to be alone with her uh, when she makes a decision that might get you all in a dangerous situation. Again, she's welcome here anytime. Well, her daughter understood that and accepted her mom's counsel, invited that friend to come over to her house. She did, and that friend began to see what a stable, accepting, loving environment could be like. Soon she was spending most of her time at that family's home. Her life began to settle down. She even started going to our church with this family. In time, she trusted Christ as her Savior, and she was baptized, and she began to grow in her relationship with Christ. Eventually, years later, she married one of the boys from our youth group. She's now a retired school teacher in California and lives and is married to that same boy from 40-plus years ago. What that wise mother proposed and did was healthy, it was positive, it was creative, and it was thoughtful. It didn't embarrass her daughter. It didn't embarrass her daughter's friend. In fact, in the long run, it wound up making a, an eternal difference in the lives of a lot of folks. Parents, if you don't know how to handle sticky or difficult situations like that, ask God for wisdom. In James chapter 1, verse 5, James tells us that uh, uh, if, if we lack wisdom, we ask of God who gives to all men liberally. If you genuinely lack wisdom and, and desire it from God, God will give it to you if you ask with a willingness to obey. Remember that 10-1 rule, maybe a 21 rule. Say 20 good things for every one negative thing you share. I love how Paul expresses this over in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. He says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment that it may give grace to those who hear. Practice that 10-1 rule. Here's a fifth assignment. Strong families have a knack for optimism and joy, even in the midst of problems. Strong families have problems? Pastor, do you mean that, that, that healthy families encounter conflict and disagreement? Of course they do. But they learn how to work through those conflicts openly, honestly, and most importantly with kindness so that as soon as possible they can return to a state of, of calmness and peacefulness. Unhappy families and unstable families do just the opposite. They nurse the pain. They hug the grudge. They blow up small disagreements into all-out wars. Uh, if you've ever watched Seinfeld, Seinfeld, I'm talking about the Costanza family. It's that family that's always making a mountain out of a, a molehill. They build skyscrapers of conflict on top of minor incidents, things that hardly even matter. You know, healthy families uh, learn how to deal with these kinds of issues, and they also learn how to laugh with one another. <laughs> I read this week, somebody said, um, if you're going to laugh about something eventually, you might as well go ahead and laugh about it now. I like that. I, I wish I had learned to do that a lot earlier. About uh, four weeks ago, I was in Waco visiting my sister who has just been uh, diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And uh, as I was leaving Waco, it was getting close to dusk. But I realized it had been a long time since I'd been out to the old Concord Cemetery. It's a cemetery, not large at all, about... Uh, maybe eight miles from downtown Waco. It's out by a little community of Belmede. It's really out in the sticks. It's right across a country road from what used to be the James Conley Air Force Base. It's now a TSTI campus. Adjacent to the cemetery, uh, only separated by barbed wire fence, is the old Conley golf course. It's not a golf course any longer. It's just pasture land, but it's where I played golf when I was in Baylor and, and uh, when I lived in Waco, it was their municipal course. One of my old friends, one of your old friends, Reggie Bowman, is buried in that Concord Cemetery. Reggie was on our staff three different times. He served with me for seven years here at Pioneer Drive before he passed away in 2006. It had been a while since I'd been to Reggie's grave, and, and I just uh, really enjoyed spending some time talking to my old friend. But as I was standing in that cemetery, looking across the 
fence at what used to be that old golf course. I remember a round of golf with my son, Bill, and my nephew, Brenner, Brenner Campbell. Brenner's grandparents, by the way, were charter members of Pioneer Drive, John and, and Jenny Campbell. Brenner's about six years older than Bill, and, and this round of golf was nine, 2005. Bill was uh, playing golf for Baylor. Brenner was a former football player, big, strong kid. Not a very good golfer, but a great athlete. Not all great athletes are good golfers, and <laughs> not all golfers are good athletes. But, but Brenner, real strong, hits the golf ball a mile, but you never know where it's going. So when I'm playing golf with Brenner, if we're heading that way, I'm standing right here to make sure I don't get hit by the ball because you never know where that ball's going when he hits it. We're on the last hole, that hole that goes right by the cemetery where Reggie was buried. I hit my drive and I was on the right side of that fairway uh, down a good ways, not as far as I'd like, but down a good ways. Brenner topped his ball over into the left-hand rough, just uh, maybe 50 or 60 yards. So Bill was helping him look for that golf ball. I was on the other side of the hole. I didn't think I was in danger, so I just kept walking. When I was about 140 yards from Brenner, I hear the swing of, of a golf club, and I hear the, 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 this three iron hit the, the golf ball, and then I hear my son Bill yell, four, which is what golfers yell when somebody's about to get hit with a golf ball. Now, Brenner didn't know to yell four. He just said, watch out. I should have just ducked and covered, but I didn't. In that instant, I wheeled around toward Bill and Brenner, who, as I said, were about 120, 140 yards away, and saw this golf ball making a beeline for me at about two feet off the ground. It hadn't skipped off the ground to slow it down. It was just like a bullet coming off of his three iron. I had about two tenths of a second to decide what I was going to do. My mind was functioning, but my body couldn't respond that quickly. Now, some folks say when you think you're about to die, your whole life flashes before your eyes. That didn't happen to me. What flashed before my mind was that scene of evil Knievel making that jump or attempting that jump in Caesar's palace at Caesar's palace in Las Vegas at night, going through the fire. And then he's coming over the top of that jump a couple of hundred feet and he loses control and he crashes on the asphalt and his body just bounces along and he breaks about 120 bones in his body. That's exactly what I pictured happening. Pain, something like that. Before I knew it, that tideless projectile hit me in my right shin at about 120 miles an hour. I immediately collapsed. I, 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 I went into a little ball on the ground, a little fetal position. I was holding on to that knot on my shin as, as tightly as I could, hoping in vain to, to stifle some of the pain. I remember rolling over my back and opening my eyes, and even though it was the middle of the afternoon, I was seeing stars everywhere. I just hurt all over my body. But what I remember hearing was not my son, whose tuition I was paying at Baylor, not my nephew saying, Uncle Stan, I'm so sorry, or Bill saying, Dad, are you all right? All I heard were the two of them laughing at the top of their lungs. They were laughing their heads off. I looked up to see where they were, and I couldn't see them because they had fallen on the ground. They were laughing so hard. I was not laughing. In fact, Bill says it's the only time in 34 years that he's heard me speak in tongues. I'm not sure what he meant by that, and I'm not sure I'm totally responsible for that. I could care less about the golf game from that point on. When I was able to finally stand up, I just picked up my golf ball, carried my bag, and limped my way to the clubhouse to get some ice to put on my now greatly swollen shin bone. About 15 minutes later, I met up with Bill and Brenner in the uh, parking lot of that golf course. For a moment, I really thought about just leaving them there because they are still snickering, still haven't apologized. They haven't said, Dad, are you okay? Just, just, they're just trying not to laugh their heads off. We get in the car. They snicker all the way back to campus. And finally, by the time we get back to campus, even though I'm still angry, <coughs> excuse me, mad at myself, for not keeping track of where Brenner was and when he was going to hit the golf ball, mad at Bill for not saying, hey, Dad, Brenner's getting ready to hit. Even though I was angry, by the time we got back to the campus, I was laughing too. 
And um, now, several years later, 16 years later or so, whenever the three of us get together and the subject of golf comes up, you can bet one of them is going to tell that story. I tell it from a completely different perspective, but somebody's going to tell that story and we're going to be laughing about it. Well, the Bible reminds us, in fact, commands us not to sin in our anger and, and not to sin in our frustration. Ephesians 4, 26 says, be angry and yet do not sin. It's okay to be angry. There are a lot of things we ought to be angry at in life, but it's what we do with our anger that's important, especially in the family. Scripture teaches us how to be self-controlled and how to be disciplined and strong families have a knack for optimism and joy, even in the midst of problems. Here's the sixth assignment. Good parents try to be available emotionally, but not omnipresent in their children's lives. Not omnipresent, but available. Simply put, parents, as, as our children grow in age, as they move into those teenage years, and especially as they approach uh, young adulthood, our great challenge is to learn how to let up on them without letting go completely. We, 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 we need to learn how to distance ourselves from them, but remember that they still need us close by. And, and that's a, a difficult balance. It's a difficult blend of closeness and distance. Parents, we should, we should always be available to help when necessary, but, but not help when not necessary. Again, it's a delicate balance, but we must find that balance. We have to let our children resolve some of their own problems, and we also have to let them endure the consequences of their actions, even if those consequences are painful. It's part of helping them become responsible, mature individuals. I think that may be one of the applications of the scripture in Ephesians chapter 6 when we're taught not to exasperate our children. Parents, be available emotionally, but not omnipresent. Helicopter parenting uh, is not the best method for parenting your children to maturity. Seventh, Strong families acknowledge problems and, excuse me, strong families, yes, acknowledge problems and they deal with those problems. It's no good to ignore genuine problems in the home. You know, alcoholics, drug addicts pretend their problems don't exist, but problems denied are problems that don't get solved. Healthy families tell the truth in love. Healthy families, when it comes to dangerous, destructive behaviors, hold each other accountable. And they make certain that each person is responsible. Healthy families neither ignore problems or catastrophize small problems. They work together to fix what's fixable. And they learn to accept what just has to be accepted. I think that's what the Bible means when it urges us to, to encourage and to admonish one another. Strong families acknowledge problems and deal with them. And along those lines, the eighth assignment, healthy families teach each other how to deal with and respond to pain. Now, I want to be real careful here. Um, I'm not trying to minimize the damage that can be caused by painful experiences in life. But it has been my own experience, and it's probably been your experiences as well, that all the things that have happened to me in my life have contributed to who I am today. If I were to ask God, Lord, remove all those painful experiences. Don't let me ever experience something painful. I would basically be saying, don't let me be who I am. Because those experiences too have contributed to who I am. Now, I don't believe that God causes all the bad things that happen to us and all the bad things in our lives, but I do believe that he uses them in the long run, for his glory and for our good. You know, so much of the craziness we see in the world today comes from people who are trying to run away from pain. People drink, people do drugs, people run from one relationship to another relationship. People engage in self-destructive behavior so that they can avoid pain. But in a healthy family, we acknowledge pain. Healthy families accept pain and they talk about it. The Apostle Paul wrote about his own pain in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He called it his thorn in the flesh and he was very honest about it. He said, I don't like it. 
I don't want it. On three occasions, he asked God to take it from him. But in the long run, Paul discovered through his pain that God's grace was indeed sufficient for all the pain he was suffering and all the failures that he had to endure. Through it all, God was with him. I love the song from the 1970s by Andre Crouch. In fact, it's entitled, Through It All. He says, so I, I thank God for the mountains and I thank him for the valleys and I thank him for the trials he's brought me through because if I never had a problem, I wouldn't know that God could solve them and I wouldn't know what faith in God could do. You know, God teaches us lessons about faith, lessons about our own lives, lessons about our relationship with him. He teaches us those sometimes in a hospital room. Or he teaches us those lessons sometimes through a difficult job or sometimes in a courtroom. Lessons we could never learn in Sunday school or in a revival meeting. If handled properly, if handled wisely, difficulties and pain can make us more sensitive, can make us more transparent and more understanding. That pain can help us grow so that we're more fully human and caring about the pain and the needs of others. I think the Apostle Paul knew that about himself and that's why he could write to the church at Philippi in the fourth chapter of Philippians saying, I've learned how to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. He said, I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Healthy families, Teach each other how to deal with and respond to pain. And then finally, strong families pass on their faith in God. Back in our text, we read at the beginning of the sermon in 2 Timothy, we read about Eunice, who was Timothy's mother. She was a strong believer, as was her mother, whose name was Lois. But her, her husband, we learn from the 16th chapter of Acts, was not a believer. He was not a Christian. And even though Eunice didn't have that help of a committed Christian husband, Timothy grew up to be one of the most influential Christians of that first Christian century. In fact, you know that Timothy was co-signatory of six of the New Testament letters written by the Apostle Paul. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we're told that Paul looked upon Timothy as his adopted son in the faith. What was it that made that difference in Timothy's life? Well, Eunice, his mother, and Lois, his grandmother, loved him enough to give him their most precious possession. In the face of less than ideal conditions and circumstances, they succeeded in passing on to their son and their grandson their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Moms and dads, grandparents, that ought to be our number one objective in life. It was in fall of 19, excuse me, of 2018 that um, my wife Claudia uh, drove up to Norman, Oklahoma to babysit our two grandchildren and allow our son Bill and his wife, uh, uh, Bill and Mallory, the opportunity to, to take uh, four days off. It was one of those four-day weekends that teachers rarely get, but she, she decided to go up there and, and, and uh, uh, give her time to babysit. She loves being with those grandchildren, as do I, but I couldn't get away. So Claudia went up there to take care of the kids, gave Bill and Mallory that opportunity to, to have a few days uh, on, a, on, a, on a trip together. The night that Bill and Mallory were flying back to Oklahoma, it was in the early evening, uh, they were on a flight that had uh, a Wi-Fi capability. And my phone pinged, and I looked down, and I had a text from Bill. And this is what the text said. Dad, our plane is in trouble. Remember, should anything happen, you all have the kids. Make sure they know that God is most important. It's not the kind of text you want to receive from your son. I immediately dropped to my knees and literally cried out to God. I then called three members of our church that I know are great prayer warriors and briefly described what was going on as I understood it and asked them to pray. It's the longest 35 minutes of my life. 35 minutes later, I got another text from Bill 
their plane had backtracked 200 miles and landed at a major airport uh, in a western state. They had to shut down that airport completely in order to receive Bill and Mallory's plane. Sometime the next day, uh, Bill and Mallory and I talked and they explained the whole situation to us. But initially, I, I gave God thanks again and again and again, and I called those three who had uh, agreed to pray and who did pray just to let them know what had happened. Now, that was several months ago. It was 20, 21 months ago that that took place. And Bill and Mallory and I, we uh, really, we never talk about it. But that last line of the text that Bill sent me means the world to me. Make sure our children know that God is the most important. Mallory's parents, Steve and Jenny Cromines, and Claudia and I did our best to pass on the faith to our children. And in what could have been Bill and Mallory's last message to us, their most important desire was that their children have the opportunity to know Jesus and to place their faith in Him. Moms and dads and granddads and grandmoms, as you help your children do their homework during these days of isolation and pandemic, don't forget to do that essential, that vital homework that we have to do as families to become the families that God wants us to be. And as you focus on the education of the heart, as you instill those values in your children and your grandchildren, as you strive to spend quality time together and practice that 10 to 1 rule of encouragement, as you learn how to let up without letting go and as you deal positively with pain and with problems, make certain, make absolutely certain that through it all, you're passing on to them your most precious possession. That is your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. No legacy, no inheritance is more important or more valuable. Moms, again, we wish you the best on this Mother's Day. I'm reminded of what William Stringer said or wrote to his mother as a tribute to her on a Mother's Day decades ago. He said, blessed are the mothers of the earth because they've combined the practical and the spiritual into the workable ways of common, everyday, unpoetic life. They have darned little stockings, mended little dresses, washed little faces, pointed little eyes to the stars, and little souls to eternal things. Blessed are the mothers of the earth. Moms, you have uh, pointed us not just to eternal things, but to the eternal one, the Lord Jesus. And for that, we are eternally grateful. We love you, and we wish you the best on this day. Thank you for worshiping with us at Pioneer Drive. It may be morning time where you are. It could be evening. It could be late at night. But we're so glad that uh, you've spent this time in worshiping our Lord together. On the screen, you'll see ways that you can uh, get into contact with Pioneer Drive if you need to, uh, questions you might have, or, or if you want to know what it means to become a member of our church and how to connect in that way. If you want to make giving a part of your worship today, uh, there's a way that you can do that through pioneerdrive.org slash give. We also have a helpline, a hotline that uh, you can dial if you need to get in touch with us, uh, 325-695-8336. Uh, if there's something that you need and uh, you just can't get to it and we could be helpful, please give us the call. And if you'd like opportunity for more discipleship, uh, pioneerdrive.tv gives Sunday school lessons for adults, uh, teenagers, children, and preschoolers. Uh, tune in and, and uh, go online and learn uh, more about your relationship with Christ through these digital uh, opportunities. If you're in a place where you can stand, we're going to close out our service as we normally do at Pioneer Drive in our, in our uh, uh, celebration worship with a reading from God's Word. And we'll read together. As you stand on the screen there, you'll see Colossians chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. Let's read. And beyond all these things, 
put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Good day, and God bless you.